So I wanted to finish up um, with with a slightly lighter note here, um, but to move us into to some of the questions that you had as we started out today, talking really about some management things, and we'll, we'll kind of bring some of that full circle. And if you have any final questions about it, then we can discuss those. But it on a lighter note here, because you probably need a laugh at six o'clock. And I'm going to go right into another video, so I'm not going to turn on the lights yet. But um, it's interesting because I've seen this video a hundred times or more, and it, it's an old Super Bowl commercial. You know, the, they do a great job with that. And I, I've run into two problems over the years where one was just recent, but reminds me of that cat video. And I, I'm allergic to cats, so I've never been a huge fan of cats. But we've had we've had a severe problem in my neighborhood with feral cats. The neighbors cross the street feed them, right? So we've had lots of feral cats. Interestingly enough, there are fewer and farther between right now after the winter that we've had. <laughs> but last week when I was in Puerto Rico, if any of you have ever been to Puerto Rico, um, and if you've not, I would highly suggest that you go. It's a lovely, lovely place to, to go. Um, but in old San Juan, there are, I'm sure, 10,000 cats, feral cats. I'm sure for every one that I saw, there were probably 15 that I did not see. And they are everywhere. And you're walking the path, you know, this very lovely path. And it, it's, a, it's a national park. It's a U.S. government-run national park. But there are boxes that are set up to feed them. And there are certain areas that you walk through and you can just smell the cat everywhere. And they, you're walking and then one kind of sneaks out from the rocks and it's like, oh my goodness. And as I'm walking through, and the reason why I'm telling the story is you start to think in driving questions. Because I'm thinking, what do we need to do to curb this cat problem? Because A, the federal government is paying for it. And I'm like, my tax dollars are going for these feral cats? in the national park, like I, I'm having a real problem with this, right? But what can we do to curb this, but at the same time not upset the organization that feeds them? Because the federal government pays for the cleanup within the park, but the organization is the one coming in to feed them. So I'm thinking and driving questions already with, with this cat problem, but oftentimes in the classroom, it seems like you have a cat problem when you're in the throes of just even traditional learning, let alone moving to project-based learning. So this next video example, this is a ninth grade example, and I think it's probably the best example that I could show you of how a teacher actually manages his classroom with project-based learning. And this, if, if you're so inclined, you can watch every video in this particular series. They'll take you through the entire project from the planning of it all the way through the implementation. But this particular piece focuses on the project as it kind of unfolds and how the teacher manages that process in the classroom on a daily basis. What did we notice? What were pieces that you picked up on? in the video, kind of aha moments. Suggesting not work with your friend, not work with someone you're crushing on. You know, just, it was brief mm -hmm. to the point and I think they listened. They seem to have a great deal of respect for this person anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you help them come up with a plan as far as how are you doing this? How are you doing? In the beginning, that questionnaire, they have to fill out the roles. Yeah, so notice that he had the roles, and from the roles, then they got to pick their teams. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there are times where I say, have at it. You know, with my AP kids, their only rule was, you can't work with each other more than twice in the whole, cl the whole time we're in class together. Figure it out, right? You're old enough, you're big enough. In my co-talk class, I was never going to let them choose because what would happen would be all my low kids would end up being in a group together. 
So I'm never going to let them choose. So it was a painful process of sitting down and splitting them all up, splitting all my highest ones up, making sure that my autistic kid who didn't work well with girls was in a group that, you know, he wasn't going to feel uncomfortable in. So it can be a very deliberate process, but the roles definitely helped. But within those roles, even though he was creating roles, go back to that idea that not all roles are created equally. So if you are creating roles, you want to make sure that everybody has equal amounts of work to do and that the work that they're doing is going to be through collaboration and not just that I'm the only one learning this piece, I'm the only one learning this piece. So make sure you're very careful if you do decide to assign particular roles with them. The, they did. They had a contract to begin and that contract was very helpful for them to kind of lay out the ideas on how they wanted to work. Um, there are different sample contracts online that you can find. Um, and, I, you know, it really depends on you. I, I taught a law class. One of the things that they had to learn how to do was to write a contract. So we, we went through that process. But you can give them a very generic one like he did that said, OK, if it's not working, what are you going to do? And I have on my, my rubrics page, I have an actual you're fired piece mm -hmm. where kids could get fired from a group. Now, if I'm working with second graders, I'm not having anybody fire anybody else, right? But the older they get, the more they can handle that piece. And it wasn't just a, a will I can fire someone because that's not, that's not a good thing, right? Because what have I done up until that point to ensure that that doesn't happen. And I can count on one hand how many times someone got fired in my class. It rarely happened, but there were different protocols that had to be undertaken before you could actually fire someone. Because the last thing you want is a phone call from a parent saying, my kid was fired the day before it was due, right? No, it shouldn't get to that point. It should not get to that point. And um, working with a group of seventh grade teachers in a district in Texas, they've implemented something called intervention in their groups. So anytime there's a problem, they have an intervention and they have to detail what they're going to do in that intervention. And so I went in to spend a day and did some classroom observations. And so I was asking the kids about the intervention and they said, well, we really don't like to hurt each other's feelings. So sometimes we don't do interventions and then it gets down until the end and then somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So then we have an intervention then. And it was a huge disaster for the teacher. So my suggestion was, let's have regularly scheduled interventions. Mm -hmm. So I walk in today and say, we're having an intervention. For the next five minutes, we're going to hash it out, or the next eight minutes, we're going to hash it out. And what specifically do each of you need to work on to get better at? And what are your peers seeing? So these regularly scheduled interventions, so it doesn't get to the point where everybody just wants to throw up their hands and say, we don't want to do this. But remember, it doesn't always have to be teamed either. There are certain times when I want to work alone. I don't always have to be teamed. So what do you say? Are you saying that that was a whole class discussion or what that was within, the group? The, group. within if, the group? Because they were grouped together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So within the group, they were having an intervention. The reason I ask that is because I've been in a class before where, as adults, where the group was not working well. Mm -hmm. It was my group. And they pulled me up on stage. <laughs> And it was embarrassing, but we come to find why one of the people wasn't right. participating in it. But it was sort of humiliating. Right. No, it her. would it would be in a smaller okay. smaller group. No, you don't you don't want to put a, you don't want to air anybody's dirty laundry in front of the entire class and embarrass anyone. But um, what were some other pieces that you saw? Cooperation. They had all the materials they needed, but they got to pick them themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we were to watch the back video on this, you know, they gave them some certain parameters with this to say, here's what you have with X, Y, and Z that you must follow in order to do this. But he never gave them the design. They had to work through that. You saw how it wasn't working and they went back. But I really like the piece because the teacher also did reflection. Because he said, we realized we had to go from video to still shots because we were doing too many testing rounds. It was taking too long. The kids weren't focused enough. So he made the adjustment and he cut back on that. They switched the modality in which they were using to do the recording. And it went much, much smoother after that point. So I like that he was very reflective um, on that aspect. 
other pieces that you picked up on? I was just um, looking at the group that was all girls, and I don't know, my mind went somewhere it shouldn't have gone probably, but you know, I was like, oh, well, that's not very balanced, and then I thought, well, there's a guy group, they just showed the guy group, you know, there's something about this theme that makes you go to gender, and I don't want to go there. Well, it's interesting because this is a school in Washington State. Now, there are no charter schools in the state of Washington, but they have schools of choice within the district. So kids, if they want to go there, they can, they can say, this is a school that I want to go to, and then they, they'll go. So this specific school, because it does make you think of gender, is Aviation High School, mm -hmm. and it's mostly boys. It's mostly boys. There are very few girls that go to the school. But it's not a very diverse school in terms of race, but it's a very low socioeconomic group, very, very poor district. Um, and in fact, this school just recently received money from Boeing, the big airline company, to build them a new building because that building that they were in was a pretty rundown warehouse that they had, they had their school. Um, what else? But, you know, and it's funny, the girl, did you hear the girls say, it's okay, we can handle it, you know, because we're usually chatty. Um, and he talks about the boyfriend-girlfriend, and I just have to say, partnered two people up together when they were in the 11th grade. The girl cried, Mrs. Lowry can't do this to me, I can't work with him, it's going to be a disaster. They just had their first baby. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they've, been, they've been married for, you know, this, I had them. 10 years ago, they've been married for about four or five years and they just had their first baby. Wow. Yes, and it all started in Mrs. Lauer's class at a project. I didn't think this story was going to go that way. It did, it did. Um, and they couldn't have been more opposite. Um, and you made them stay together. I did. I made them stay together. I said, work it out. They and they did. They did. <laughs> no. Did you hear in the end where the teacher talked about, I wish in retrospect, that I had required a more formal write-up of engineering terms. Did you pick up on that? I've seen it so many times that I do. But I like to bring up that point because, again, whatever that final assessment is, we want to make sure that we can assess each student individually to ensure that they have that content. And so he's saying that this was a great project. I know that they learned a lot. But individually, I wish I would have had that really formal write-up of engineering terms because this was a, an interdisciplinary engineering and math class that they did this in. And so it was really important. The other piece that I want to bring up on this is the experts that were used. They found one. The one found 20 others, right? So I, the teacher, didn't have to find everybody. I made one contact, and then all of a sudden I have all of this help. And it's a really good example, too, of how each you know, set of kids, they're doing the same kind of end product. What they do and how they get there is very different. But do I want one person to have to listen to every single presentation? No. So now I have 20 volunteers. I split them up. They only have to watch two or three presentations. So it's not very taxing on those experts as they come in and not saying, hey, can you... And I, I've, ha I've had individuals that have volunteered to look at 150 portfolios, you know. I, I can't believe that they said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. But they 150 portfolios and gave comments on all of them. And that, that was an awful lot for me to ask. In retrospect, going back, I wish I would have said, hey, would you take a look at 10? And everybody else in your office, maybe they would take a look at 10? Any final thoughts? That was a great teacher. He actually started in Columbus, Ohio, before he moved to, I forget the school that he was at, but I know he's from Ohio and he started in Columbus before he moved to Washington. Um, we're running towards the end of the night, so I, if you, as you just look at these, I know we've talked a lot about these tonight, but if there are any of them that you see that you say, hey, I still need a little help on this. Can you give me some insight, Dana? Just let me know and I'll talk about those. I was going to bring up that group again. I just didn't want to sound so pessimistic. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I did have a group of seventh and eighth graders and I just told them, we're not doing caps on. I mean, mm -hmm. I just can't fight with you guys over doing caps on, mm -hmm. you know, because. I mean, if 
you know, if you pass out the laptops, they're you know, making tacos in that game. And, so is it, part of it, part of it may go back to the fact that whatever the topic is for capstone, they don't find very authentic or relevant mm -hmm. to that. And so exactly. saying, what can we do? Because now we want, now we want to do whatever we can for these gorillas and finding whatever that is, because once you find that thing that they say, Oh yeah, this is what it is. And it could be the most boring material ever, but how do I make that really boring material authentic and relevant to them? And then that's the game changer. That's how that's how you bring them in. Mm -hmm. So I you know, do they get to choose they or get to they choose don't? from three questions? So there's three driving oh, questions great. per grade well for seventh grade and for eighth grade. Um, but just working with a partner or mm -hmm. working with someone else. It's like there's an argument, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, there's that student that's suspended, and, and you know, they'll be back next week. And um, do, they, do they have to work in partners? For well, they can, they can choose to work alone, but that's gonna be a lot of, a lot of help in one-on-one. Mm -hmm. What I did with my college prep is, how many of you chose question one, and I was able to, you know, guide right. them through that question two. But for this group, it's a seven, a seven, eight split, and whenever they're given a choice to work together, it's to work together to play, mm -hmm. um, to to socialize. Um, with the driving question, they're really struggling. They they really are to, to where I just. So what 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 is their question that they have? Um. Okay. One of the seventh grade questions has to do with the water system. Um, okay. We know that in Africa, they uh, where water is scarce. Um, how can you design a water system that will sustain the population? That's one of the driving questions for the seventh grade. Another one, which is a really interesting one that they could really go with, is that there's so many unsolved, uh, there's so many unanswered problems that we have. Technology mm -hmm. can answer so many questions, but what about Questions that technology can't answer, mm -hmm. like you know, broken heart or um, you know a cure for cancer or whatnot. So uh, research Renaissance period and inventions of that time period, and um, what can that tell us about what we can create or can you create something or design something for an issue? And then so so yeah. I, I think I, here's part of the problem that they're so broad mm -hmm. that the students are probably getting overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the teachers that I featured in my book taught a geographic information systems class mm -hmm. just outside of DC and he had seniors and they had a capstone within the GIS and he would say to them, pick whatever problem you want that can be solved using GIS. And he said, as seniors, and most of them really high level kids spent more time trying to figure out the problem than actually solving it. And so when he went back and said, okay, let me, and he contacted the government agencies because they're right, you know, they're in Northern Virginia, just outside of DC. He, he said, okay, what problems do you have that are on the back burner that you don't have the manpower, the hours to focus on, but it needs solved, give them to me. And then once he gave his kids a list of like 10 things, they said, that's what I want to do. It's so it, and it sounds like they're shutting down immediately because they don't know where to start right. because the question is so broad. Right. So I could do something like what you suggested mm -hmm. with him, but the capstone you have to choose from that because the judges right. get those questions. So if you let's say you go with those questions and say, all right, which one interests you, mm -hmm. split them up that way, and then help them to narrow down that focus more mm -hmm. uh, through whatever process you, you decide, mm -hmm. but to give them some of that hand holding in the beginning mm -hmm. versus that because I mean just the just the term capstone is enough to mm -hmm. probably make their hearts go, oh my goodness, you know, I, I don't, right, I don't, <laughs> you know, this is, this is too much for me, I don't want to do this, I'm shutting down before it begins. So if, if you can help them, if you can help them to narrow it down, because if you give them something that's much too broad, it's the same thing as giving them something that's much too narrow and focused. You give them something too narrow and focused, and they can't do anything with it, all right, I'm, I'm done, and it's all lower level, or you give them something that's really, really broad, and then they're like, ah, the complexity level of it is just too much for them. So that would be my suggestion. I may go out there on the internet and see 
see if I can find some cast on questions that they can choose from, but uh, they won't be in this yeah. 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 But, but do you see what I'm saying? Even using those same questions, yeah. use the same questions, but help them to narrow. Maybe if you provide them with a narrowing of the focus choices yeah. from those larger questions, it might help them. Groups. I'm doing that with the other classes, but for some reason, this particular class, when they get together, immature. Yes, very, very, very. Well, and things. when when we're saying repetitive presentations, it's like what we just saw. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we all have these end products that are very similar, but we don't want to present it all and overwhelm some person. So where he had multiple ones being showcased, or I've seen teachers that they will, as a class, pick the top three. And then the top three get showcased. So as a class, we're deciding, and then they do it that way. So that kind of helps with those repetitive presentations because I've sat through them, you know, like this, right? We don't want we don't want to do that. Um, the dominant versus shy. If we go back to that individual level piece versus you know some of the brain writing, those are all tactics to help to give students voices versus allowing one person to to take over. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we talked about the six thinking hats the last time that I was here. If you use that six thinking hats and you, the, your person that's not normally the person who will speak out, give them one of the hats where they kind of have to take control and force some of those more dominant personalities to take some of the hat colors on where they, they have to sit back a little bit. It's a really good exercise for them to have to listen versus always putting forward ideas. You know, some of that resolving conflict we talked about, doing some of the intervention pieces, having the contracts to begin with. You got these kids that throw up their hands and say, I don't care. It's because we're dealing with middle school. I mean, I can see that when they're having a fight. Well, you know, you say something right. about, well, how am I going to grade you then? You know, right. and, like, and, and again, if we go back to that authentic and relevant piece, that nips a lot of that in the bud because once we can get them to care about the gorillas right once we can get them to focus on those things otherwise when am i going to use this math i don't need to I, why do i need to know this math well if we're going out there and we're planting a garden and you have to learn how to do measurement and you have to know um you know volume in terms of how much water you need to put in the soil and that kind of thing I, yeah now you need to know because it, it has some end product result versus just doing a worksheet Anything else? Um, so this now what piece, because we, we focused on that so what. Um, I'm not going to make you do a reflection on this right here, right now. You can certainly, on your honor, just think about it as you drive home tonight, because we're, we're nearing the end here, and I know that you need to do the, um, you need to do the survey for, the, the, for Mayerson. But this three-piece protocol, it's thinking about refining our practice um, and its past, present, and potential. So think about where you were before you came into the first session in October, right? And before, and maybe you've tried full things, maybe you haven't tried full things, maybe you've only tried bits and pieces, but where were you before? Where are you currently in terms of your instructional practice and how it's been affected by <coughs> any of these components of project-based learning. <clears throat> and then finally, that potential piece. Where do you want to be in the coming year? You know, I, I know we're getting into the testing season coming up here in a couple of weeks. So we, you, only, you only have uh, that you have 10 <laughs> weeks left of school. You guys must really get out early. I get out at 4. No, no, you mean the same end of May. Wow, that's early. We're the second week of June. Um, and we're probably having a snow day tomorrow, so it's going to be a pushback even more. Um, but, you know, where where do you want to be in the coming year with your instructional practice, and how has that been affected by the things that we've talked about over the last four sessions? And hopefully it's made a difference, at least some, some difference, a small difference somewhere, maybe one of these. Maybe it's just one element. Maybe it's all eight elements. Maybe it's just one instructional 
um, strategy that we talked about, whether it's, you know, implementing blooms and trying to focus on that, whether it's some of the critical thinking pieces that we talked about, whether it's brain writing and some of these inquiry components and or um, incorporating critique and revision into what your students are doing. So just think about where you want to go with that because we know even though um, time is short in this year and summer seems to go by very, very quickly, as teachers we're always thinking about what we want to do and where we want to go and what we need to change and how we need to move on. But that's our three P's protocol. You can do it with kids too. Where were you before this project? Where are you now currently in this project? Where do you want to be with this project before we end it up um, and look at the potential for it? Helps them to think, it helps them to reflect. Remember, we only have 84,600 seconds in a day. Some of those days we use up more than others. Um, and depending on whether or not I decide to drive home tonight will depend on how many of the seconds I actually use, right? If you do have any other additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can send me an email. You can go to my danalauer.com and I have a contact page there. Or you can tweet me a question if you have Twitter, at Dalen, any of the above. 